We will respond to the threat of climate change knowing that the failure to do so would betray our children and future generations. Some may still deny the overwhelming judgment of science, but none can avoid the devastating impact of raging fires and crippling drought and more powerful storms. The path towards sustainable energy sources will be long and sometimes difficult, but America cannot resist this transition. We must lead it. Sustainability is about meeting current needs while not compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That's a wonderful vision. I think it's one we can attain. It's going to take a lot of work and we are on the path to trying to do that here at Cornell by looking at the intimate interconnection between energy, environment and economic development. Mycotoxins have been studied in different ways by different disciplines, but the opportunity that we have at Cornell is to bring together a team of really strong scientists from across the disciplines to answer a integrative question in a way that few universities would be equipped to answer. I'm leading a team that is assessing mycotoxin exposure in pregnant women in Zimbabwe. I'm Rebecca Stoltzfus, and I'm a nutritionist. I'm Rebecca Nelson, I'm a plant pathologist. My lab is working to make corn plants that are more resistant to the fungi that produce mycotoxins. My analytical lab has the capabilities to run mycotoxins in a variety of foods and feeds. My name's Karen Bischoff and I'm a veterinary toxicologist. In the last few years, we focus more and more on toxins made by mold, uh, the mycotoxins. I'm Dan Brown, I'm a nutritional toxicologist. So this is a highly multidisciplinary project and we would not be doing this if the Atkinson Center had not um, facilitated some initial brainstorming conversations that brought us together um, and helped us craft the proposal. The team that we, that we have draws across um, three of the colleges at Cornell, the vet school, the ag school, and human ecology to address a problem in a really, in a really new way. So we have expertise from clinical and diagnostic services from mammalian physiology, from human nutrition and human biology, and agriculture and crop sciences. It's highly novel. I feel very privileged to be able to be working with this team and, and doing this work. Climate change is a reality. We can have a great political argument about the causes. I want to pass that step. That political argument has gridlocked us from moving forward for too long. It's undeniable, but that the frequency of extreme weather conditions is up. Uh, we have a new reality when it comes to these weather patterns. We have an old infrastructure and we have old systems. And that is not a, a good combination. It's pretty clear now that the green transition that was anticipated some years ago is not actually taking place. We need a different approach. And a return to a New Deal style approach of putting people to work providing socially and environmentally necessary goods and services, we feel is a timely idea and one that would have positive impacts on our society. What our project does is look at how can we link uh, the need to address climate change and create jobs. Based on an executive order in New York State to reduce emissions 80% by 2050, we're creating a jobs GHG mitigation index that will calculate how many and what type of jobs are needed to do what science says we need to do to fight climate change. We're already seeing the effects of climate change through droughts, floods, forest fires, and we could do work like expanding public transit programs, um, retrofitting buildings for energy efficiency, expanding solar and wind energy. Thousands of jobs create, could be created um, to prevent the worst effects of climate change. Also, the New York State economy is actually the 12th largest economy in the world if it's viewed as an individual country. So it would have a new, huge impact not just on U.S. emissions reductions, but on global emissions also. If you're interested in renewable energy or sustainable energy, uh, biomass is really one of the areas that can contribute the most uh, in the next 50 years or so, um, but at this point there are just so many options that uh, there isn't a clear winner of you know, 
this is the best process for converting the biomass into some form that can be used in a motor vehicle. The, the point of this is to try to winnow through some of the many choices that are out there uh, and try to find the ones that are most suitable for this scale of production. So one of the goals of this project is to find out whether we can take a biomass waste stream and convert that partially over to useful hydrogen fuel. When you think about doing this on a local scale, you can think about the trash from each of our households being centralized in the municipality, in the city, and then extracting useful energy, including fuel, from that. So it's sort of the local energy, local fuel movement, if you will, that you can compare to the local food movement, getting our foods just from that surrounding region. This is a corollary that allows us to extract our energy from the local resources that are really right around us, and in this case, the, the best use possible from our waste streams, which would otherwise literally just be wasted um, and going to a landfill. Here we can extract useful energy and potentially fuels from those. Apples are a very important crop in New York State. To successfully produce apples, one needs insect pollinators. Our project focuses on the role of native bees in apple pollination, and we're examining the threats to those native bees, including pesticides, pathogens, climate change, and habitat loss. Our lab is using mason bees as a canary in the coal mine to look at the amount of pesticides found in native bee nests. This is one of the first studies to look at pathogens, the viruses, fungi, and bacteria that infect mason bees. We plan to test whether bees that are exposed to higher level of pesticides tend to get more sick and whether any of those pathogens are coming from the European honeybee. Our research on apple pollination requires that we accurately identify native bee species collected in apple orchards. At Cornell, we have excellent taxonomic expertise and resources for carrying out bee identifications. One of the amazing things we're finding in this study is the sheer number of native bee species in these apple orchards. We found up to 100 native bee species in our four-year survey, and we're sure that most of these native bee species are contributing to apple pollination. So we're starting just now to see growers really interested in implementing practices that will help these native bees um, provide the pollination services that they can for fruit production. We can achieve a sustainable future. There are many important and large problems in front of us, but we are working on solutions. We're working together. If we stay together, we work at it. It's going to take time. It's going to take effort. It's going to take resources. But we can do it if we do it together.